It's now time for oral questions. I recognize the member from Niagara Centre. Good morning, Speaker. This question is for the Premier. In August, the Premier's friend, Greenbelt developer Shakir Ramatula, told the Integrity Commissioner under oath that he did not socialize with Amin Masoudi, the Premier's former Principal Secretary, and that they had never been in each other's homes. Earlier today, the Trillium revealed strong evidence that Mr. Masoudi had visited Mr. Ramatula's mansion on multiple occasions. The Trillium previously revealed that Mr. Masoudi had a massage with Mr. Ramatula in Las Vegas, also contradicting their testimony. Why did the Premier's friend and his former Principal Secretary repeatedly give misleading testimony to the Integrity Commissioner under oath? Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I suspect uh, if the Integrity Commissioner has any questions, he will undertake uh, a review of that with Mr. Masudi. Order. Order. Supplementary question. Speaker, during the time when Mr. Masudi was the Premier's Principal Secretary, the government handed out Minister's zoning orders to Mr. Ramatula like they were candy. And shortly after he attended the Premier's daughter's wedding, Mr. Ramatula benefited from changes to the Greenbelt, as well as various ministerial amendments to municipal official plans. A document obtained by Freedom of Information shows that on the day the government announced changes to the Greenbelt, the Premier himself had demanded proof that Mr. Ramatula would be able to develop his Greenbelt property in Nobleton. Through you, Speaker, why did the Premier give such preferential treatment to his friend? The Minister of Municipal Affairs and Health. Well, Mr. Speaker, what we're trying to do across the province of Ontario, which the member should know, is that we're trying to get homes built in every part of the province. Now, I know the member is opposed to this because in his own community, where they had the opportunity, where they had the opportunity to build affordable homes for people, the council turned it down, Mr. Speaker, in his own community. Now, that's not our approach. Our approach is that we're going to do whatever it Order. takes to build housing for people, and that includes all across Order. this region. In our fastest five growing regions, what they need is sewer and water capacity. We're going to give them that, Mr. Speaker. We're going to remove, the, remove red tape that is stopping homes from being built, despite the objections of the members opposite. We will get it done for the people of the province of Ontario because the dream of home ownership shouldn't just be for the people that have been here for decades. It should be for the people that are here now and the people that want Response. to contribute to helping Ontario be a bigger, better province. The final supplementary. Quite an answer to a Greenbelt question, uh, Speaker. Government officials used code terms like special project when discussing the Greenbelt grab. Government emails were altered to replace references to the Greenbelt with terms like G-Star in an apparent attempt to conceal what they were doing. Now we have further evidence that the Premier's friend and his former Principal Secretary repeatedly gave misleading testimony to the Integrity Commissioner under oath. Speaker, how will the Premier explain all this to the RCMP? Mr. Municipal Affairs and Housing. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. As I said, uh, if Matlock has any additional information that he would like to provide the Integrity Commissioner, he can do that, Mr. Speaker. It is Order. not for the government to make those types of investigations. If the Integrity Commissioner requires additional information, I suspect the Integrity Commissioner will ask for that information. If the member opposite has additional information that he would like to provide, I can give him the address of the Integrity Commissioner so he can provide that information. Because what happens in this place consistently, Mr. Speaker, the drive-by smear without any evidence, Mr. Speaker, that is what the NDP does. And you know why they do it, colleagues? because they have nothing to offer the people of the province of Ontario. They're opposed to housing, they're opposed to transit, they're opposed to education, they're opposed to building new hospitals, Mr. Speaker. They're Response. opposed to everything. And that's why the people of the province of Ontario oppose them and shrink them every single election. They're irrelevant, and the people of Ontario know it. I remind members that we refer to each other either by our riding name or ministerial title as applicable. The next question, 
The member for Hamilton Mountain. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Today, the Ontario Autism Coalition is here at Queen's Park calling for action. They have brought solutions to the issues that our children, youth, and adults are facing in the autism community across the entire province. Issues like wait lists, determination of needs assessments, funding, housing, and health and safety for our loved ones. Issues that keep family up at night, forced with hard decisions to be made about education, therapies, and finances. In 2018, the Premier promised that no family would have to protest on the front lawn. There were 24,000 kids waiting at that time. Today, there are 67,000 children waiting. So I ask you, will you and your government listen and hear the calls to action today and truly help the autism community? Members, so please take their seat. Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Thank you very much, Speaker. And I, and I thank my honourable colleague for the question, mm -hmm. Mr. Speaker. We have been listening to the families from day one when I became a minister in this portfolio in this very important file for the government and for the Premier. Mr. Speaker, I reached out to the families, to everyone that's involved, to listen to them, to receive, to, to get that feedback from families, from service providers, from those, from experts, those with lived experience, Mr. Speaker. That's why this government doubled the funding of the Ontario Autism Program. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, there were at that time when we formed government, there were 8,500 families receiving supports and services. Today, thousands and thousands, tens of thousands, Mr. Speaker, are receiving supports and services through multiple streams: the Family Foundational Service, the Urgent Response, the Entry to School, their Caregiver Mediator Response Program. Mr. Speaker, is programs that families can have access to the second they reach and access uh, and register with Access OAP. None of these programs were available before. Even core clinical service, Mr. Speaker, on which I Thank you. Thank you. The supplementary question. Speaker, they may have doubled the funding, but they tripled the wait list. Mm -hmm. There's a problem there, Minister. Speaker, time Order. and time again, I have asked about the wait list for core services, which is now 67,000 kids and counting. Mm -hmm. Every time your minister responds, he uses words and phrases like world class and no child left behind. In this year's budget, in this year's budget, Autism was mentioned once, and yet it fell very short of world class and was not much more than a re-announcement of the previous year's funding. A scramble to try and cobble together your broken program. And Access OAP provides no indication of where their kids are in the queue. This is the number one question of all of our offices that we receive from families who are desperate to find the support their children need. So, Premier, I ask again, on behalf of the 67,000 kids waiting, when will they be told it is their turn and that they're not going to be left behind? Mr. Children, Community and Social Services. Thank you very much, uh, Speaker. And I want to. Uh, I was, didn't have enough time to be able to finish my first answer, Mr. Speaker. After we doubled the Ontario Autism Program, thanks to the Premier and thanks to the Minister of Finance, this year we had down, announced an additional 20% to the funding, to now $720 million, compared to the $300 million of the previous government, which the NDP supported. And, Mr. Speaker, I 100% back the program. You know why? Because this program was developed by the autism community. It was the members of the autism community, those with lived experience, family members, clinicians, experts. Those are the ones who put this program. And even the implementation team was made up of those from the autism community. So yeah, I'm absolutely supportive of the, of the program that Order. we have in place. I will continue to meet with families. And Mr. Speaker, I said this from day one, that we will come to work every day to make sure Response. we improve their lives and go home to do better than next day every time it comes to And the final supplementary. Speaker, in June of 2022, Draven Graham, at the age of 10, went missing from his home. Draven was autistic. His family and his community were desperate to find him. Draven never returned home. 
Since that time, over 100,000 people have petitioned and called for an alert that would have notified the community to his disappearance. In March 2023, I tabled Bill 74 that would have offered another solution to bringing missing people home safely. Later that same month, your House leader discharged the bill to the Justice Committee with a promise to Draven's family and community that it would be brought back swiftly. Over a year later, Speaker, we are still waiting. People are still signing petition, and the OAC is here today asking for the immediate passing of the Missing Persons Amendment Act. Premier, will you finally honour your government's word and ensure a quick passing Question. of Bill 74? And to reply, members, will please take your seats to respond. The Solicitor General. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And to be very clear, we are concerned when a vulnerable person goes missing. And nothing is more important than the safety of everyone in Ontario. The issue of missing and vulnerable people is serious and deserves careful attention. And Mr. Speaker, that's why we have acted. That's why our government has funded initiatives like Project Lifesaver in the riding of Sarnia Lambton and in Essex and in other towns in Ontario. Mr. Speaker, this project as example provides vulnerable people with bracelets that help police find them when using radio signals when necessary. Mr. Speaker, the opposition does not have an Order. exclusive for vulnerable people. We take this matter seriously. The next question, the member for Waterloo. Uh, thank you very much, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Uh, the agri-food uh, industry in Ontario contributes $47 billion to Ontario's GDP each year, and more than 750,000 Ontarians are employed throughout the agri-food supply chain. Farmers play a vital role in Ontario. They are the backbone of this province. We are losing 319 acres of farmland a day in, in, in Ontario, and yet this government continues to advocate for undisclosed industrial sites located on prime agricultural land like in Wilmot Township, where developers offered to buy the land before any official rezoning information happened, just like the Greenbelt scandal. My question is to the Premier. Why is this government prioritizing putting money in the pockets of developers rather than supporting Ontario farmers? To reply, the Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. Mr. Speaker, I have to be honest here. You know, I just met with dairy farmers of Ontario Order. this morning, and the Order. fact of the matter is, time and again in this House, I have rose to talk about the investments that, under the leadership of Premier Ford and the, the support of this entire government, we are making historic movements forward in support of our agri-food industry. One example is the $1.7 billion that we're investing over five years in partnership with the federal government through the Sustainable Canadian Agriculture Partnership. You know, another example is the what we are hearing from our dairy farmers of Ontario today, because they're ready to grow, Order. and they know it's with our government, with our leadership, that their industry is going to continue to grow and flourish for generations. Response. And the supplementary question, the member for Timiskaming Cochrane. Thank you, Speaker. Let's let, let make this clear. What's happening in Wilmot could happen in any farm community in Ontario. So a developer shows up offers you a deal, you don't take it, and then the government comes along. If you don't take the deal, we're going to expropriate it. That could happen anywhere in Ontario, just like it's happening in Wilmot, for an undisclosed project. And then what will happen is if this undisclosed project is a factor, is, and all of a sudden the land that was taken from the farmer will quadruple, will ten times in value, and that money will go to the speculator, to the developer, not to the farmer. Is that is that the Ontario that you support, Minister of Agriculture? Members, will please take their seats. Once again, I'll remind members to please make their comments through the chair. Order. 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 Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. Well, thank you very much. And I have to tell you, Speaker, that I am so incredibly disappointed to hear the rhetoric and the drama coming from that Order. member opposite. Because that's all it is. It's Order. complete rhetoric. 
because the fact of the matter is we're laying down the groundwork and the pillars to grow Ontario. Again, the meeting I had this morning with the dairy farmers of Ontario, point two, our Grow Ontario strategy, where we're going to be increasing the consumption and production of Ontario-produced right. food and beverage yeah, yeah. by 30% We're identifying how they can support that strategy because I can tell you specifically that dairy farmers in southwestern Ontario Position come to order. Grow, and I am going to do everything we can to make sure that they understand they've got full support of our Ontario government. The thing that the members opposite could really do if they were sincere about helping farmers throughout Ontario is fighting that carbon, carbon tax. tax. Because yeah. the most Thank you very much. Order. I apologize to the Minister of Agriculture and Food. I couldn't hear you. Order. Your time's up. Your time's up. Yeah. Thank you. There's another member that would like to ask a question, just in case anyone's interested. Order. I'll let start the clock. Member for Kitchener Conestoga. Well, thank you very much, Speaker. And let's talk about that carbon tax. My question is for the Minister of Energy. People in my riding of Kitchener-Conestoga continue to express concerns over the federal ta carbon tax and how it will make their lives more expensive. Since the introduction of this regressive tax, costs of food, transportation and people's everyday essentials have reached a new high. Speaker, contrary to what the Liberal members in this House believe, the carbon tax is not, and I repeat not, in the best interest of Ontarians. That's right. Its sole purpose is to take money out of people's pockets. The punishment and the never-ending tax increases under the federal Liberals are propped up by the carbon tax queen herself, Bonnie Crombie, every step of the way. And shameful, Speaker. Speaker, can the minister please tell this House why the federal government must immediately cancel this punitive tax? Thank you. To reply, the Minister of Energy. So, Mr. Speaker, the federal Liberals seem like they're unwilling uh, to listen to farmers across uh, Ontario or across Canada. Uh, the current queen of the carbon tax, Bonnie Crombie, the leader of the Liberal Party here in Ontario, is happy to have the federal carbon tax in place. And if the NDP really wanted to stand up for farmers like our dairy farmers who are here today, they would join us, Premier Ford and our team, in fighting the carbon tax all the way to the Supreme Court. It's just activities here in the legislature to get attention. They're not actually standing up for farmers in Ontario while our Minister of Agriculture is, our Premier is, by fighting the federal carbon tax, Mr. Speaker. Now, if you don't think the carbon tax is having an impact on our dairy farmers, you're crazy because everything they do requires natural gas or propane or some other type of heating oil, Mr. Speaker, and the cost is enormous to Response. heat the farms. The cost is enormous to transport the milk to the processing facility and then on to the distributors, Mr. Speaker. It's a huge, huge impediment. I'll tell you more. Member for Waterloo West. Supplementary question. Well, thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for his uh, response. And at a time when the cost of living is at an all time high, the federal government decided to hike the carbon tax by 23 per cent earlier this month. According to the parliamentary budget officer, even the rebates that were promised for families and businesses did not cover the costs that people have had to pay. It is disappointing to see the federal and provincial Liberals simultaneously turn a blind eye to experts' warnings as the hardships uh, of, as, as we continue to see the hardships that people face here in the province. Unlike the Liberals, our government is taking action to reduce the risks of impacts and carbon emissions through our clean energy advantage. 
while prioritizing affordable and reliable energy for everyone. Speaker, can the minister please explain how our government is securing clean, reliable, and affordable energy for Ontarians without needing the carbon tax? Right. Minister of Energy. By investing in clean, reliable, affordable nuclear energy, Mr. Speaker, by, by investing in affordable, reliable, clean hydroelectric power like the Sir Adam Beck facility down in Niagara Falls, Mr. Speaker, the storage facilities that we're implementing across the province, Mr. Speaker. We saw what the Green Energy Act did when the Liberals were in charge of our energy, energy sector here in Ontario. It drove people into energy poverty, and the federal carbon tax, which the queen of the carbon tax, Bonnie Crombie, supports, is doing the same to farmers like the dairy farmers of Ontario today. And not just the dairy farmers, Mr. Speaker. What our agriculture minister wanted to get in was the impact on just the grain farmers alone. The carbon tax is going to increase costs to just the grain farmers by $2.7 billion by 2030, Mr. Speaker. That's what the NDP stand for. That's what the Liberals stand for. We don't. It's time to scrap the tax, Mr. Speaker. Members will please take their seats. Order. Order. Restart the clock. The member for Nickel Belt. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Ma question est pour la ministre de la Santé. Thank you very much, Mr. President. My question is for the Ministry of Health. This level, the government has the data that shows this, but they are actively hiding that information from the public. The government was elected six years ago, and what have they done, Speaker? They have been disrespectful and harmful to our health care workers. Is the minister so ashamed of her work on health care that she is hiding the workforce numbers? Minister, member for Stormont Dundas, South Glengarry, and parliamentary assistant. Let's be clear, that was a forecast in 2022, and that is why our government is investing record amounts into our health care system, including $743 million in this year's budget over the next three years to address immediate health care staffing needs. That's on top of the 63,000 new nurses that have registered wow. to, to work in Ontario since 2018. An additional 80,000 nurses will join the health care workforce by 2028, Speaker, increasing the number of post-secondary education seats as well by 2,000 registered nurses and an extra 1,000 registered practical nurses. Speaker, Our government will continue to do what is required to ensure that we have the best publicly funded health care when and where the people need it. Supplementary question. The government can brag about how many nurses and health care workers have registered. They can continue to spend millions of taxpayers' dollars to pay for advertising across social media during the hockey game, on the radio, bragging about the numbers of health care workers, but they are refusing to show us the numbers because they know that it is much worse under their watch. So can the minister explain to the people of Ontario, while the government is pulling the wool over our eyes? I heard the comment. I'm going to. There's, there's a reaction in the House. I'm going to ask the member to withdraw. Withdraw. Order. Member for Stormont Dundas, South Glengarry. Speaker, the member opposite is well aware that we are investing $85 billion into our health care system this year alone, which is a 30 percent increase since 2018 when the NDP propped up the Liberal government at the time. It's important to remember where our health care system was when Minister Jones was sworn in as the Minister of Health in 2022. Ontario and the rest of the world was only beginning to recover from the global pandemic, Speaker, a pandemic that showed the holes in Ontario's health care system caused by over a decade of neglect by the Liberal government, propped up by the NDP, Speaker. Since Minister Jones was sworn in as the Minister of Health, our government has registered a record number of new nurses two years in a row, Speaker, registering a total of 32,000 nurses, Speaker, in Ontario. Our government recognizes that the status quo was no longer working for Ontarians, and that is why, under the leadership of Premier Ford, we have taken action to build a more connected and convenient health care system. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. The next question, the member for Windsor, to come see. Hey. 
Thank you, Speaker. Uh, my question is for the Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade, who's done phenomenal work bringing investment to Windsor Essex like we've never seen before. Great the carbon tax affects every single worker in Ontario. It doesn't matter what sector you work in or how much money you make, the carbon tax is hurting everyone. Workers see it when they go to the pump to fill up their car with gas or when they go to the grocery store to buy food to put on the table for their families. At the same time, it's taking money away from business owners who want to invest in their workers. We want our businesses to succeed so we have great paying jobs. And we need them in our country, in our community, all over the province. But we need the Liberals to stop burdening them with the carbon tax. Speaker, can the minister explain how the carbon tax is hurting Ontario's economy? Very good. Good. Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. Speaker, we have been saying this for quite some time. The Liberals don't realize the importance of leaving the people of Ontario with more money in their pockets. Think of the entrepreneur who wants to undertake a new business venture. That extra dollar in their pocket means being able to do, bring their ideas to life. It gives them the ability to scale up by hiring new workers and entering new markets. That extra dollar can be the difference in what makes their dream become a reality. That is what the Liberals are trying to take away when they hike taxes at every opportunity they get. They missed an opportunity to correct course and scrap the carbon tax in their budget last week. Spons. Speaker, we urge them to scrap this terrible tax today. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. And uh, certainly, we've revitalized our province's business environment after the previous Liberal government's failed economic experiment. We witnessed that in my community firsthand. But when the Liberals keep hiking taxes, they are pushing away entrepreneurs and businesses and stifling innovation. Shame we want you. businesses to see Ontario as the place where they can succeed, but the Liberals are telling them not to come here with their carbon tax. And unfortunately, Bonnie Crombie and the Liberals in the House endorsed the Trudeau Liberals' approach. Why would they do that? They want to Order. see the carbon tax hiked every single year Order. to try and undo the progress we've made in Ontario. We need the Prime Minister to stop listening to his Liberal friends and start listening to the hard-working people of this yeah. province. Hey. Speaker, uh, can the Minister question. let the Liberals know the risks that accompany their carbon tax? Thanks. Minister of Economic Development. Thank you, Speaker. The Liberal approach of higher taxes just does not work. Member it's for been Ottawa tested South, come to order. time and time again, and every single time it fails. Look at the previous Liberal government, Speaker. Their high taxes chased out business. It cost us 300,000 manufacturing jobs in the past years. Businesses were looking everywhere but Ontario to invest and expand. Now the federal Liberals are trying to do what they did here in Ontario, all over Canada, all over again with their 17 cent a litre carbon tax. And now they're doubling down on their budget disaster of last week. We've built up Ontario's global reputation as the best place to do business. Fun. We did it by lowering taxes, Speaker, not by raising taxes. Scrap the tax today. Thank you. The next question, the member for Ottawa West Nepean. Thank you, Speaker. This government's underspending on special education means that children with autism are going without badly needed supports in school. This is not only impacting their learning, it is putting their safety at risk. More than half of principals in Ontario say they've had to ask parents to keep their child with special needs at home because staff shortages are putting their safety in jeopardy. Why does the Premier not believe that children with autism deserve a safe, high-quality education in Ontario? To reply, the Minister of Education. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Well, first off, we worked very hard to ensure all children 
are in schools for the next three years with stability because children with special education needs are the ones with the greatest exceptionality are the ones who need stability in schools. And our party alone stood up and delivered deals with every teacher union providing some stability in their lives. We also increased the funding for special education. We're talking about an increase of nearly $540 million since 2018, $125 million more this year compared to last year. 3,500 additional EAs in school boards, as reported by our school board associations. Mr. Speaker, we know there's more to do. It's why in this year's budget we announced additional funding for additional staffing, in addition to supports for co-op education to help ensure these young individuals are able to put their talents to work in the labour market and seek employment and build skills. We'll continue to be there Spons? every single year to increase funding and staffing and supports for our kids with the most exceptional needs in Ontario. Here, here. The supplementary question, the member for London Fanshawe. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, Premier, I wrote the minister in June of last year on behalf of families like Bethany's. Her daughter has been waiting for years for autism core services and is still waiting. Bethany tells us at her daughter's school there is only one EA for three kids with special needs. And without OAP funding, her daughter is falling further and further behind because she cannot get the ABA or the speech therapy she needs. Under your government, autism services are only getting worse for this family and all the families here today. Premier, why are kids waiting for years for the OAP core funding they need and deserve so they can thrive? Mr. Children, Community and Social Services. Th th thanks very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the honourable member for the important question. Mr. Speaker, as I said earlier, when we formed government, there were 75% of the families were waiting and with no prospect of support at all. Today, because of the supports and services under the leadership of this premier, we have increased the funding to, to more than double, 600 million. And this year, as a result of the budget, which unfortunately so far you voted against, and I hope you vote in favour of it when you have the next opportunity because in the budget, there's an increase of $120 million more to support families. That would help us more with getting tens of thousands of families enrolled in core clinical services, like the member alluded to. But, Mr. Speaker, Order. unlike before, when families had one route to service, IBI, today they have multiple opportunities through family foundational services, response. through urgent response, through entry to school, through care mediated therapy, and, Mr. School, tens of thousands of families are accessing Order. these services because of our decisions. Okay. Thank you very much. The next question. The member for Algoma, Manitoulin. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister uh, of Children and Community and Social Services. Your busy uh, morning for you. Developmental services remain woefully underfunded in Ontario. In the run-up to the 2024 budget, developmental services organizations across Ontario led the Five to Survive campaign, calling for a 5 percent increase to their base funding to make up years of frozen budgets. The 2 percent they did receive is totally inadequate. I wrote two letters to the minister outlining the strain on groups like Community Living Algoma, Community Living Espanola, Community Living Manitoulin. Speaker, these organizations work tirelessly to serve people with developmental disabilities while working on increasingly tight budgets. My question to the minister, why did he ignore the needs of the developmental services sector once again in this budget? Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I thank my honourable colleague for the very important question, Mr. Speaker. In fact, quite the contrary. I will tell the, remind the honourable member that under the leadership of Premier Ford and this government, we have increased support and funding for developmental services in Ontario by over a billion dollars since we formed government. Mr. We have increased funding for supportive living for those that require those supports and services by more than 2.2 billion dollars in the province of Ontario, Mr. Speaker. In our most recent budget, which I hope the member and all my colleagues in this House support, we increased funding by $310 Order. million dollars for the sectors who are doing member for Hamilton great Mountain, work. Come to order. These organizations are doing fantastic work in every corner in our province, and we have their back, Mr. Hey. Speaker. A supplementary question. Again, to the minister, the fact is, Speaker, that this government has never lived up to their word 
for adults who have developmental disabilities. Here's an example from people in my writing. Karen and Jack Ribou, in my writing, were forced to set up their own microboard to support their daughter, Emily, through a passport program. They work full-time coordinating support for their daughter and making sure that she gets the services she needs. This year, they were informed that they will receive a 0% increase to their passport funding, putting them behind inflation once again. Karen and Jacques wrote to my office saying, this just piles on from previous years of lower than inflation increase and even years when zero increases, zero percent increases, and cuts were the norm. Speaker, people with developmental services deserve to have the resources to live healthy and full lives. My question again to the minister. Minister, refusing to make that a reality, why is this minister refusing to making that a reality for people that are in need in this province? Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Mr. Speaker, I, again, I thank the honourable mem member for the question. Mr. Speaker, when we formed government, we heard from families and service providers who were telling us, and the member would know this, they are facing the same challenges as they had done 10, 15, 20 years prior to, because nothing was done to support these families, Matt, uh, Mr. Speaker, which is why, through our long-term vision, with Order. the help and support of the sector and families, we introduced Journey to Belonging, Mr. Speaker because we want to make sure every single person in our province, regardless of where they are, is able to participate fully in their communities. And that's why, as I mentioned earlier, Mr. Speaker, we increased the funding to more than a billion dollars in the developmental services in the province of Ontario to $3.4 billion today. Mr. Speaker, the member talked about living, supportive living. We increased supportive living funding by more than $2.2 billion. Response. And Mr. Speaker, through Journey to Belonging is our long-term vision, but we're making the, the, the process easier, more streamlined for families so that it can access services and supports digitally, regardless of where they are in the province. Thank you. Thank you very much. Order. The next question, the member for Brantford Grand. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Energy. Great. Across the nation, premiers from all political stripes are speaking out against the federal carbon tax and its detrimental impacts on families and businesses. Speaker, inflation has already reached devastating levels, resulting in many households not being able to make ends meet. Every day, I receive emails and phone calls from constituents who are struggling to get by as a result of the carbon tax. I know that's, that's the case for members all across this great legislature. Speaker, the message from the people of Ontario is clear. They feel betrayed and punished for having to pay more at the pumps just to go to work and to feed their families. This carbon tax must be scrapped immediately. Speaker, can the minister please tell this House Question. why the carbon tax queen, Bonnie Crombie, and her Liberals must come to their senses and join us in calling to an end to this, di this disastrous tax? Thank you. Thank you. Minister of Energy. Mr. Speaker, this is what happens when you leave the Liberals and the NDP in charge of energy policy. The Green Energy Act tripled our electricity rates, Mr. Speaker. By 2018, they were booted out of office and remain the minivan party that we see today, Mr. Speaker. The federal Liberal government is doing the exact same thing, only they're doing it with their carbon tax, Mr. Speaker. They're making life unaffordable for the people of Ontario and the people of Canada. The member from Brantford Branch just mentioned the price of the pumps. It's up around a buck eighty a litre right now, and the federal Liberals want to triple the carbon tax. That is holy Mackinac in the words of Joe Bowen, Mr. Speaker. That's going to make it completely unaffordable for the people of Ontario. We have to do the right thing. The queen of the carbon tax, Spons. Bonnie Crombie, does have to come to her senses. The NDP have to come to her senses. We can't afford this carbon tax. We have to scrap it today. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you, Minister, for that response. The carbon tax, Speaker, pushes up prices across the board, affecting everything from fueling our cars to building homes for Ontarians. And this is not the end of it, Speaker. 
this tax is going to triple by 2030. People cannot afford to pay their bills now. How are they going to afford it then? Speaker, Ontarians need more financial relief, not additional taxes. While our government has consistently opposed the carbon tax from the start, the NDP and Bonnie Crombie's Liberals continue to support further hikes to this punitive measure. That, yep. Speaker, is unacceptable. Speaker, can the minister please explain why Ontarians cannot afford more NDP Liberal taxes? Thank you. Minister of Energy. It's pretty uh, simple, Mr. Speaker. We've seen this movie before, and it doesn't end well. When the Liberals and the NDP teamed up on energy policy in Ontario, we saw 300,000 manufacturing jobs, including many in the automotive sector, leave for other jurisdictions. We came in in 2018. The current Minister of Northern Development was the Minister of Energy. He stopped the Green Energy Act madness, Mr. Ah. Speaker, and we brought stability to our energy sector. And as a result, as a result, we've seen jobs flooding back into Ontario at a record rate. But the federal Liberals, they want to do it all over again, Mr. Speaker. It's unbelievable that they want to triple the carbon tax, which is already crippling the people of Ontario and crippling the people of Ontario. And they chirp over there. They say, oh, where's your plan? We have a plan, Mr. Speaker. It's called Response. powering Ontario's growth, investing in our nuclear reactors at Pickering and at Darlington and at Bruce, building small modular reactors in Darlington, investing in our water power. Thank you. Thank you very much. Stop the clock. Order. Start the clock. Next question, the member for Parkdale, High Park. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Education. The Toronto District School Board is facing a $26.5 million budget deficit. This is after $17 million in cuts to programs and services for the upcoming year. The Conservative government has cut $1,347 per student since 2018. The chair of the board has written to the minister saying programs students rely on are in jeopardy. Will the minister address the TDSB's structural deficit to avoid further drastic cuts? Thank you, Speaker. You know, I think the priority of parents in this province is the government's land deals that keep their kids in class, and that's exactly what our government has done. Not a peep from the New Democrats or Liberals who couldn't do that when they were in government. We signed deals that provided stability. The first principle of your question is you've got to keep kids in front of their teachers focused on the basics of education, which is why we hired 7,500 more education workers. It's why we hired 3,000 more teachers. It's why we just doubled the funding to build more schools in this province for families in Toronto and the smallest towns and villages of this province. We are investing more in public education than at any time, but we're doing it alone. When we brought forth the budget, that added billions of investments to publicly funded schools, Liberals oppose that investment. When we hire thousands of additional teachers to help our kids get back on track, Order. you oppose the investment. But, Mr. Speaker, we're not going to rely on the opposition to do what's right. We're going to continue to go Response. back to basics and demand better for the people of this province. And supplementary, the member for University Rosedale. Thank you, Speaker. Back to the minister. These are the facts. Schools in our riding are facing cuts because the Conservatives are refusing to properly fund our public school system. We have 15 Order. parents 15 parents from Kensington School today. Order. Kensington is losing two teachers. They just learned their kids will be in a grade four, five, six class. That means a teacher will have to explain and teach three lesson plans each and every day. That is not a recipe for student success. That is a recipe for kids being left behind. My question is to the minister. Will you commit to more school funding so students in this province, including the kids of these parents who are here today, can succeed in school? Minister of Education. See, Mr. Speaker, the members opposite seem to conflate 
that funding is the barrier to a qualified teacher in that classroom, but you know that there's a retired educator in Toronto, as we speak, ready to get in that classroom. But because of your ideological aversion, like it is just crazy that you'd rather a Order. babysitter, Order. those parents would rather, you should tell the parents that the official policy of Liberals and Democrats is to rather a babysitter instead of leveraging a retired educator in classrooms in this province. It's inconceivable and it's frankly shameful. We have a solution right now supported by Principals Association, Trustees Association, and the common sense parents of this province. Get off this ideological aversion to leveraging people with experience and stand up for what's right. Qualified educators in the country of Ontario. Order. Order. Member for Niagara West will come to order. The member for Hamilton Mountain will come to order. Start the clock. Next question, the member for Canada, Carleton. Waiting. Waiting. Thank you, Speaker. When you ask the people of Ontario if they're better off now than they were six years ago, the answer is order. a resounding no. Government side, come Patients, to order. Nurses, doctors, teachers, students, including the autism community, farmers and renters, all dealing with restrictions, slowdowns and cuts to essential services. But I will tell you who isn't dealing with cuts. This government has the largest, most expensive cabinet ever. This Premier's office is also the largest, most expensive Premier's office in history, doubling in size and salary. If this isn't the gravy train, I don't know what is. Mr. Speaker, can the Premier please explain Order. what exactly his 28 Order. extra staff members each earning over $100,000 annually, are doing for the people of Ontario. Order. Order. The Premier may reply. Wow was right. It's, just, it's a wow. I can't believe what I just heard the members say. The people are not a little bit. They're a thousand times better. There's 700,000 people collecting a paycheck that never collected a paycheck under them. There's $28 billion of investment in the auto and EV sector that, under their government, they ran them right out of our province. And wait till tomorrow, one of the largest investments in Canadian history in the auto sector will be announcing that. So talk to the hundreds of thousands of people that have a secure job for years to come. Talk to the people that are in the tech sector, over $20 billion of investment, that we've overtaken Silicon Valley and San Francisco Bay Area. We're going 365% faster than that region when it comes to the tech sector. Talk to the people that are employed with a three billion dollars investment Response. of life sciences that have a stable job. Talk to all the businesses that we reduced $8 billion from. We've never raised a tax on the people. Of Stop the clock. <laughs> Member for Ottawa South, come to order. The member for Renfrew, Nipissing, Pembroke, come to order. Start the clock. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. This government has the largest, most expensive cabinet ever. This government has the largest, most expensive Premier's office ever. And now we are being told that the Premier's former Principal Secretary visited a developer's home several times, contrary what was told Order. to the Integrity Commissioner. What exactly is the Premier paying this enormous staff to do? Premier. Let's just remind everyone, this is the member that said we're better off with a carbon tax. Yeah. Following 
the queen of the carbon tax, Bonnie Crombie, this province is better off. Tell the people that are filling up their gas tanks and looking at 17 and a half percent, at 17 and a half cents more, as we reduce gas by 10.7 cents. Talk to the talk to the kids behind me about the new schools that they're seeing built across the province as you close 600 schools or building 16 billion dollars of schools. Talk. Talk to the 12,500 doctors that are now registered right here in Ontario. Talk to the 80,000 nurses. When they were firing nurses, we registered 80,000 nurses. Mr. Speaker, we have become an economic powerhouse, not just in North America, but around the world. We're going to continue growing Ontario. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Order. The next question, the member for Peterborough Kawartha. Oh, finally, a good question. Thank you, Speaker. <clears throat> My question is for the Minister of Indigenous Affairs. Oh. The Liberal carbon tax is punishing Ontario families and businesses. And after this month's 23% tax hike, Ontarians are paying 18 cents more per litre at the gas pumps. Shame. And that is just unacceptable. This costly tax drives up the prices of everything but especially in remote Indigenous communities across northern Ontario, where the cost to transport goods is already much higher compared to anywhere else in the province. Speaker, we know the opposition NDP and independent Liberals are more than happy to see this tax nearly triple by 2030. Shame. But the people of Ontario have had enough. They want to see this tax scrapped today. Speaker, can the minister please tell the House how the Liberal carbon tax is adversely impacting on rural, remote, northern Indigenous communities? That's a good question. Minister of Northern Development and Minister of Indigenous Affairs. Mr. Speaker, yesterday and today, the Minister of Energy and I got a, a real perspective on the cost of this carbon tax. There's a couple of isolated First Nations communities who operate their own independent power authorities. And between the shortened winter road season and the impact of the carbon tax, what would otherwise be years that they would break even, several years in fact, uh, they're now running significant deficits that they don't know how to pay for. Now, Mr. Speaker, uh, these are serious issues, and so far, the NDP position has been nothing short of gallimaufry, Mr. Speaker. Oh, yeah. And I can't help but wonder, when Bonnie Crombie was in the House of Commons, standing shoulder to shoulder with Justin Trudeau, whether she imagined she'd take the throne of the Ontario Liberal Party and become the queen of the carbon tax and live up to the uh, provincial Liberal standards of their understanding of North Ontario, that it's a wasteland. It's not, Mr. Speaker. We're proud of our vast region. We want affordable living in Northern Ontario, Mr. Speaker, and it's this government. Thank you. Any supplementary question? Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for his response. The carbon tax is a tax on everything, your groceries, your gas, heating your home, and so much more. Shame. And it's disgraceful that the federal Liberals and their provincial counterparts are forcing, forcing this burdensome tax on the individuals and families all across Northern Ontario. Shame. Speaker, the Liberal record speaks for itself. The previous Liberal government that was propped up by the NDP neglected the North for years and actually called it no man's land. Uh. Speaker, unlike the opposition, our government will always support northern communities. That's right. And that's why we're the only party in this legislature that's standing up to the federal government and demand they scrap this tax. Here, here. Speaker, can the minister please elaborate on the detrimental effects that the carbon tax is having on the people, the communities, and all of the businesses across the north? Mr. Northern Development. Not, not too long ago, Mr. Speaker, the Minister of Small Business uh, federally uh, attended an event in Sudbury, and she was pressed by business owners like Kelly Scott of Berry Down Paint on how, what they planned on doing to mitigate the effects of the hard-hitting carbon tax. Of course, the nervous Minister of Small Business managed to absquatulate every time the question was put to her, Mr. Speaker, but, but we know the truth. 
any attempts by the federal government to mitigate the cost of the carbon tax will not th flow to the consumer. That means more prices for gas, more prices for everything in a fully integrated supply chain from food to steel to mining to forestry, Mr. Speaker. This, this tax is expensive. The, the opposition needs to stand with this government, who's working to reduce the costs of these commodities and make life affordable in Northern Ontario, and just scrap the tax. Thank you. The next question, the member from Meshkigawak, James Bay. Thank you, Speaker. Mike. No more municipalities are meeting this week. On their agenda, forestry, resilience, and partnership with Indigenous communities. We know there will be fire, uh, forest fires. First Nations communities will be most impacted, and municipalities will welcome evacuees with uh, the means they currently have. Yet, we never seem to be quite ready for a wildfire season. Premier, can you tell NOMA members today, we are, are we ready for fire season? And to reply, the Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and thank you for the question. And absolutely, we are ready for fire season here in Ontario. I've talked to this House on multiple occasions about our recruitment efforts for forest fire rangers here in Ontario, supporting those frontline workers, supporting all those that work the logistics to make sure that the system is ready, supporting those in the air, those on the ground, those at the outbases all throughout Ontario. Mr. Speaker, this government has made it a priority to be ready for forest fire season in Ontario. In fact, we raised the budget from a paltry $69 million back in the Liberal days to $135 million today to make sure that we are keeping people safe all throughout Ontario. That is our mission, Mr. Speaker, and we are we are not stopping, and we are going to make sure that every community in Ontario Response. is safe, and we are ready for forest fire prevention every single day. The supplementary question. Well, I disagree with the minister. We're down 81 million from last year's budget. We have 50 crews missing. That represents 200 firefighters, forest firefighters. Monsieur le Président, ma question est pour le Premier ministre. My question, my question is for the Premier. 50 teams are already missing. The government is always just reacting rather than preparing ahead of time. Speaker. Northern municipalities need to know, are you going to properly fund right now municipalities to ensure they're ready to deal with forest fires and all the evacuees? Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I'm not sure if my voice carries far enough across to the other side of the House, but I'll reiterate again, $69.8 million is what was being spent on forest fire uh, fighting when we took over as a government. Today, it is $135 million, and that's just the base, Mr. Speaker. The reality is that forest fire fighting in Ontario is a proposition where we spend every dollar that is needed to get the job done. And that is our promise to communities all throughout Ontario, is that not only will we have the resources, again, in the ground, on the air, wherever it needs to be, but we will spare no expense to make sure that communities stay safe here in Ontario. Mr. Speaker, we are committed to the safety of communities, individuals, and infrastructure in this province. We show it every single day with our actions. I call on the opposition to support us as we make sure that Ontarians remain safe. Thank you. The next question, the member for Richmond Hill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Long-Term Care. The Liberal carbon tax is adversely impacting every sector in Ontario. It drives up the cost of building expenses from the cost of materials and transport to the cost of operations. Speaker, people in my riding of Richmond Hill and across Ontario want to ensure that family members in long-term care homes receive the best possible care. They are concerned that the regressive carbon tax is negatively affecting the vital sector. Our government must continue to ensure that residents in long-term care homes receive the quality of care and the quality of life they need and deserve. Speaker, 
Can the minister please tell us the tell this house what our government is doing to protect Ontario families, especially our seniors, from the negative impact of the carbon tax? Minister of Long-Term Care. Mr. Speaker, that member sits about two seats away from a Liberal member, so she had to have heard earlier during question period while the Minister of Economic Development was talking about all the progress we're making in our economy, that he said, you sure, you sure talk about the carbon tax a lot. And he's absolutely right, because we're not milking this, unlike our dairy farmer friends. This is a major problem here in the province, and it affects long-term care, because Carbony Crombie, the queen of the carbon tax, continues to support this regressive tax. That's going to triple by the end of 2028. This is a problem for long-term care homes because we are facing the ever-increasing cost of construction, as that great member said. So it's, we're, we're still going to fight back. That's why we increased the construction funding subsidy as well as doubling the local priorities fund to $35 million. We're going to help our homes get more training, more equipment, better quality food to our residents and our home speaker because this is the right thing to do. Our province was built by the hardworking seniors in our communities. We're going to take care of them. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you for the Minister for your response and especially for the respect and the care you give to our seniors. It is encouraging to hear that our government is taking action to ensure that seniors are able to receive the care they need and enjoy the high quality of life that they deserve within the very community they help plan and develop. For 15 years, the previous Liberal government neglected the long-term care sector. Now the leadership of carbon tax queen, Bonnie Crombie, they are turning a blind eye on how the carbon tax is negatively impacting our seniors. Speaker, they did nothing to stop the 23 per cent hike earlier this month. Unlike the NDP and Liberals, in this legislature, our government will continue to fight the carbon tax and protect Ontario seniors. Speaker, can the minister tell the House what our government is doing to support our long-term care sector? Minister of Long-Term Care. Well, Speaker, we are doing a lot, and I appreciate that question, Speaker. Let's just look at the most recent budget. Right? I mentioned the $155 million for a construction funding subsidy 2.0. That's going to allow for thousands of more spaces to get online. But above and beyond that, the highest increase to level of care funding, this is operational support for staffing, for food for our seniors, the highest increase in history at 6.6% annualized. And, Speaker, a one-year support of $202 million. That's $2,543 per space in long-term care so that seniors can get the repairs they deserve, whether it's a leaky faucet, new televisions, new supports, new equipment, new reckoning speaker. This is a government that said we are taking care of our seniors. Now, the Liberals can heckle the carbon tax all they want, but their record on long-term care is clear. When they exited in government in 2018, they built 611 net new beds. We have 18,000 built to shovels in the ground, well on our way to 58,000, Speaker. We're getting it done for our seniors. Thank you. The next question is the member for Oshawa. Thank you very much, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. The cost of rent is out of control. Oshawa has experienced some of the most dramatic rent increases in the province. Between 2014 and 2023, the cost of renting increased by 61 per cent. These aren't just numbers, these are real people. I met with Mark, who is relieved that his family found an apartment so they're not on the street. But now they're facing a steep rent increase, and they already can't afford groceries. People are hurting. Will the government bring back real rent control for real people? Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Yes, that's the difference between the, uh, the opposition and us, uh, Mr. Speaker. What we believe that will help uh, the, uh, the, 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 the challenge that people have with finding rental housing is to actually build more purpose-built rental housing, Mr. Speaker. I feel that that will work, and we're showing that it does work, because under the policies of this government, uh, Speaker, we have the highest level of purpose-built rentals, not in one year, not in two years, but ever, Mr. Speaker. And that is giving more people more options, and that is what will bring the price of rental housing down across the province of Ontario. Thank you. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. This government has failed to fix the soaring cost of housing, and renters in my community are paying the price. Oshawa has faced steeper rent increases than even Toronto, nearly four times Order. the provincial guidelines. We used to have real rent control in Ontario. 
Now, all we have are loopholes for big corporate landlords. People are spending 50, 60, 70 percent of their income just to keep the roof over their head. That's money they should have for activities with their family or a night out at a local restaurant, money to save for the future, but instead, they're in such a mess. And will this government deliver real rent control, please, so that people can get back to their lives? Thank you. Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Thank you, Speaker. As you know, there are rent, uh, there are rent controls. The other things that help people uh, uh, affordability, Mr. Speaker, is when you reduce taxes for the people of the province of Ontario. Of course, we have, uh, we have done that. Of course, we remove the tolls uh, on on roads in the members uh, uh, in the members area. We have delivered. Uh, 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 a one fair system that allows people to save about 16, uh, 1600 bucks uh, a year uh, per person, uh, uh, Speaker, and that is a, a massively uh, a huge benefit for the people of uh, her community. I was speaking to the mayor of Oshawa, and he could not have been more supportive of the things that we are doing to help his community grow. That includes the groundbreaking investments that have ma we've made in the automotive sector in that area. So let's see, we're, we're building more purpose-built rental housing than ever before. We're getting more shovels in the ground for housing than ever before. We've saving the automotive sector in, uh, in, in Oshawa and making it bigger. We're expanding the GO trains. We're building more hospitals uh, in that part of the region. We've got more jobs. We've reduced the cost of Response. transit and transportation. We're building more schools, more long-term care care homes, reduce the cost to the people in Oshawa and all of Durham Region. I'd say we're on the right path, Mr. Speaker. Sure, sure. Thank you very much. Okay. Point of order, the member for child the Minister for Children, Community and Social Services was the first one. Huh? Oh, wow, Labor. congratulations Labor. on sorry, I apologize. Sorry. Minister of Labor, Immigration Training and Skills Development. It's no cabinet shuffle. That's the premier. Um, speaker, I just uh, want to uh, recognize dairy farmers Adam Petherick, who's here, and recognize someone who's not here. I've not had the opportunity, and I feel it's important to read their name into the record. And that person is Sid Atkinson, who we tragically lost at the end of last year. Uh, Sid was a giant in the dairy space. Um, he was never afraid uh, to uh, tell you a story, to give you his opinion. He advocated for dairy farmers in our community across Ontario, former member of the board. He will be dearly missed by our community, by dairy farmers across Northumberland, Peterborough South. And I just want to recognize that. Thank you. Thank you. And again, I apologize to the minister. Premier is next. Well, first of all, I'd like to invite the uh, dairy farmers over to my office for a cold glass of chocolate milk. <laughs> and I'd like to invite the class up there. If you have time, I don't know your schedule, come by and say hello and we'll get a picture in the office. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Member for Oshawa has a point of order. I do have a point of order, Speaker. Uh, I tabled written question number 165 to the Minister of Transportation on February 26th. Today is April 24th. I've waited nearly two months, two months to get an answer that requires a response after 24 sessional days. The response regarding transportation enforcement officers was due yesterday. When should I expect that answer from the minister? I have to remind the minister that uh, Minister is required under Standing Order 101D to file a response within 24 sessional days. Uh, the responses are now overdue and ask when um, the give, give the House some indication as to when the response will be forthcoming. Government House Leader. That, uh, Speaker, I will uh, uh, confer with uh, the Minister of Transportation. We'll make sure that the, uh, the response is presented to the House by end of day. Thank you. Thank you. Point of order, the member for Renfrew, Nipissing, Pembroke. Speaker, I, I want to apologize. I got caught up in my own excitement. Uh, the Whitney Public School is coming tomorrow. <laughs> I, I'm a day ahead of myself, and I apologize. I apologize to Whitney Public School. I've been waiting a long time for them, and I apologize to the House for my order. Thank you. Minister of Energy. Point of order, Mr. Speaker. Um, I just want to correct my record. Um, yesterday, when I was talking about the uh, multi-million dollar expansion at BWXT, I inadvertently said they were creating 200 million jobs at BWXT. While I wish that were true, it's 200 plus jobs that they're creating at BWXT. Okay.
All right. Thank you very much. There being no further business this morning, this House stands in recess until 3 p.m.